Um, I would like to welcome Eva Galperin for the keynote. Um, we couldn't ask for a better keynote speaker for this year, um, especially from the virtual world. Uh, it's great to connect uh, with Eva. Um, Eva is the cybersecurity director for EFF. Um, I don't need to explain what EFF stands for to anyone in cybersecurity field. And, and if you don't know, you should actually go and read about their blogs and their researchers and their activities they are doing uh, in the world to make the so-called cyber uh, space for everyone. Um, Eva, thanks again for um, taking your time to do this keynote. Uh, now I'll leave it to you. Um, you can start the presentation. Thanks, Eva. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate this. The pandemic has really given us all an opportunity to uh, see a variety of conferences that otherwise uh, would have been closed to all of us. Because while uh, I cannot travel all over the world at the moment's notice, I can do uh, many more conferences from the comfort of my own home. Uh, fair warning, this is the comfort of my own home. So my cats may be making the occasional appearance. They have very strong opinions about end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, so if they start ranting, you'll know what happened. Uh, so I am here to talk to you about who deserves cybersecurity and how, can, how we can expand our circle of care. So uh, as it happens, I, uh, I was once a cybersecurity professional uh, working in, uh, in the private sector, and I took classes in cybersecurity as an undergraduate. Uh, and what I was taught from the very beginning is that cybersecurity is for governments and companies. Cybersecurity often focuses on protecting uh, people and companies and organizations with power and money. Uh, the very definition of, uh, of cybersecurity when I was learning about it was that cybersecurity is the practice of protecting systems, networks, and programs from digital attacks. Um, cybersecurity, again, for governments, for companies, uh, but not for people. Uh, interestingly, cybersecurity is not the practice of protecting people. So I'm going to talk to you today about the ways in which this approach to cybersecurity has kept us from, from addressing important harms. And I'm here to talk to you about my vision for what cybersecurity could be and to talk to about, about what you as cybersecurity professionals can do to make that vision a reality. So I'm going to start uh, with, with a very sexy topic. I'm going to start with a, with a topic that most cybersecurity professionals are reasonably familiar with. I'm going to talk about APTs. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with APTs, APT stands for Advanced Persistent Threat, and it is usually, you know, very loosely, uh, thought of as shorthand for uh, government actors. Uh, the reason for this is because prior to the description of these government actors as APTs, uh, most work in cybersecurity was really focused on keeping out uh, hackers and criminals. And often hackers and criminals can be uh, sort of pushed along by simply making it, uh, rather than securing your system, but simply making it too much of a pain in the ass for somebody to break into your system when they could in fact just go ahead and, uh, and compromise someone else. Uh, that is not the case with APTs. The, the thing that was considered to be really revolutionary uh, about the study of APTs is that uh, APTs uh, treat compromising your particular system and you as their job, because frequently it is, and you can see them keeping normal hours, logging in at nine o'clock, starting their phishing campaigns, and then phishing until, say, around five when it's time to go home, perhaps even taking a break for lunch. Uh, that is a, a very different kind of opponent to be facing, and it requires a very different uh, way of thinking about risks and threats. So when I started studying APTs, uh, this was probably shortly before the, the Mandiant report came out. Uh, Mandiant is a security company. They put out a, uh, a report about what they called APT1, which uh, was uh, sponsored by and located inside of mainland China. Uh, 
the particular uh, the the particular activity that uh, the the Mandian APT one report covered was a campaign that they had carried out against the New York Times, uh, and the purpose of this campaign was to uh, uncover the identity of uh, some anonymous uh, sources, which had been used in stories about Chinese government corruption. Uh, now, I'm fairly certain you can guess that uh, the Chinese government was not interested in unmasking these sources so that they can give them an award for their anti-corruption work. Uh, this was definitely uh, going to be the, the very first step in a series of human rights abuses. And what was particularly novel about this study of APTs at the time was that it really put uh, journalists on notice and made uh, newsrooms understand that they were being targeted, uh, not just by hackers, not just by criminals, um, not even by, uh, by you know, other people that they had reported on, but by government actors who were going to make it their job to compromise them. Uh, and so we started seeing a lot of APT reports come out. We saw APT reports about uh, Russian threat actors, uh, including 28 and 29, uh, the various bears. We saw a variety of pandas. Uh, we saw uh, North Korea get some attention. Um, we even saw reports about uh, Five Eyes actors. We saw reports about uh, the NSA's behavior, about the CIA, about uh, GCHQ in uh, in the UK, about uh, the um, also Australian actors and Canadian actors. So this uh, usually, if somebody was putting out an APT report. The purpose of the report was to show a particularly sophisticated program of uh, of attack, and uh, the word sophisticated was was really pushed forward. There was a lot of discussion of the the sophistication of this targeting, and at the time, most of the targeting was um, came, it came in the form of email attachments or text messages or messages to. Uh, uh, to Facebook groups, and it was largely targeting people's uh, computers and you know, with rats, and tr also trying to compromise their various social media and uh, and email accounts because you know that's that's where the data was back in the early uh, 2010s, um, and it was around this time that I was training journalists and activists in uh, what we went on to call surveillance self defense. And uh, as, as part of that training, uh, I became aware of uh, Syrian opposition figures who were being targeted with malware. Uh, this was at the very beginning of the uh, sort of Syrian civil war, uh, before things got especially violent. And uh, we were seeing this conflict between uh, pro-Assad hackers and uh, opposition activists. And uh, the pro-Assad hackers were not directly working for the government and they were targeting uh, various opposition figures and their, and their supporters with honestly, what was fairly unsophisticated malware uh, using not no O days, but you know, extremely well known vulnerabilities in you know Flash, uh, which is malware in and of itself, and um, we started seeing a lot of you know targeting in PDFs and world word files. And again, this is this is not sophisticated targeting at all. And because it was not sophisticated targeting, uh, even though many you know, large security companies had access to the same information that I did, um, they simply did not write about it. They did not find it interesting. And that's because the information security world tends to fetishize complexity. The point of writing an APT report is to show the world how smart you are, how sophisticated your company is, that they're able to recognize these very complex, highly you know, dangerous threats. And if we can find this stuff 
uh, for these activists or for these journalists of the New York Times, just think about the protection that we could offer you. Essentially, AVT research at the time uh, is uh, was a form of advertising for, for one's own uh, cleverness. And that's why we did not see reports about Syria or uh, later Vietnam or work that I later did in Kazakhstan or Lebanon or Iran. And that was largely because these APTs were seen as, uh, as being below notice. They were uninteresting. They, you know, Iran was, was writing their, you know, uh, was writing their rats in Delphi. And that's very boring. Uh, to information security people, you know, hey, we can protect you from, uh, you know, PDF lures that are being sent to you via email is really not much of an advertisement for your tremendous sophistication as, uh, as a security company, whereas we can protect you from an attack by, you know, uh, the NSA or the CIA or Chinese actors, that's, uh, that's, really a, a very different kind of proposition. So we saw this very serious problem in the way that ABTs were being, were being treated. Uh, the, the good news is that uh, over the years, the focus has really shifted away from the sophistication of the actors and towards the people who are being harmed. Uh, one of the, the big reasons for this shift has been the work of Citizen Lab, which is uh, located at the University of Toronto. Uh, and um, a lot of the work that they have done, especially the most recent uh, Pegasus files, has focused specifically on the people who are being harmed uh, through the use of sort of cyber mercenary technologies and, uh, and software. And on one hand, uh, this, this is work that is in some ways very sexy uh, in that they are reporting on mobile malware, they are reporting on uh, zero click zero, you know, no click zero days and, and other you know, magical uh, unicorns. But at the same time, the focus is always on telling the stories of the people who are being surveilled uh, rather than privileging the very sophisticated attacks over uh, over very simple attacks, because honestly, very simple attacks still work. So that is one of the ways in which uh, our our focus on protecting uh, governments and companies and uh, power and money has had really for many years blinded us uh, to these extremely important harms to journalists and activists. Um, one of the, the other ways in which I, I was sort of trying to address these harms was uh, through writing EFF's uh, Digital Privacy and Security Guides. Uh, this includes EFF's Surveillance Self-Defense, which you can get to at ssd.eff.org, and the Security Education Companion, which you can get to at sec.eff.org. Surveillance Self-Defense is really focused on uh, providing uh, privacy and security advice to ordinary people, whereas the security education companion is focused on providing advice and uh, training materials to people who are going to give uh, security trainings. So at the time when I took over the writing of surveillance self-defense, we had a uh, we had a version of surveillance self defense that already existed when I came to work in, uh, at EFF in two thousand and seven. It was relatively short. It was uh, focused largely on the United States, and it was largely focused on giving people legal advice. Here, here are the limits of the kind of surveillance that the government can do. And there was sort of a brief addendum that we called Surveillance Self-Defense International, where we just sort of assumed that all legal bets were off and here is how you protect yourself. Um, when, when you don't necessarily feel like you have strong legal protections in places where the rule of law is strong. Uh, so imagine our tremendous arrogance that we thought, well, that the rule of, of law is very strong in the United States. Surely we're not doing anything like, I don't know, mass surveillance of absolutely everyone, uh, which was later uncovered by um, 
by a whistleblower from inside of AT&T and was further confirmed in 2013 uh, by uh, the Snowden revelations. In fact, one the very first Snowden revelation, the very first file uh, that Snowden leaked uh, turned out to be sort of the smoking gun in our uh, in our case against the NSA for their uh, sort of mass warrantless wiretapping that they were doing uh, on everybody in the world. It was tremendously invasive, and we were only able to sue the NSA because of this document that Snowden leaked. But at the time that we started writing uh, privacy and security guides, uh, privacy and security guards, guides were largely written by information security professionals. And they were written uh, with a sort of implied audience in mind. They were never very specific about who it was that was going to read their guides, but they always sort of imagined that it was some person vaguely like them. Uh, then, and that everybody had the same privacy and security needs, and all you needed to do was to, you know, quote unquote, use Signal, use Tor. Mind you, this was before the invention of Signal, uh, but to use and and uh, encrypted services like uh, PGP encrypted mail, or at the time uh, OTR uh, with Pigeon, and everything would be okay. Uh, this was a very simplistic view of, uh, of privacy and security for ordinary people. And most importantly, what, uh, what surveillance self-defense and most of the other guides that were out there was missing was a lengthy discussion of threat modeling. Uh, these guides really needed to begin by talking about the ways in which there is no one size fits all solution for privacy and security online. There are some best practices. There is good security hygiene, but the, the devil is in the details. And so we ended up writing and rewriting and re-rewriting our guide. Uh, and we made sure that our guides were uh, regularly uh, translated and into, I think, eight different languages and that they were regularly updated. So every time that we write a guide, there is also a date that essentially says, uh, this information was true as of this date, which was the last time that we updated this guide. Uh, and that way you have some idea of how stale the information was. Uh, in 2013, I gave a talk at uh, the Chaos Communication Club and uh, I described the internet as a graveyard of abandoned uh, privacy and security guides. There were a lot of them, and honestly, most of them were stale, most of them were not updated, many of them were not translated, none of them uh, included a description of uh, what threat modeling is, how threat modeling works, uh, how you might go about choosing the appropriate uh, tools for your particular threat model, um, all of that information was missing, which I found really disturbing. And we were able to really add this discussion uh, to the entire uh, approach to teaching uh, privacy and security online. Uh, the other element that uh, that EFF added, and this is building on work that was um, already be being done by organizations like Frontline Defenders and the Writers of Security in a Box, uh, was uh, that we came in with a human-centered approach, um, but also one that um, that made use of a concept from, uh, from the sort of health and drug use world uh, called harm reduction. So it is, uh, it is not enough to simply walk into a room, tell people to use end-to-end -end encrypted services, uh, pat yourself on the back smugly and walk away. Uh, this is not helping anyone. It's, it's just a way of making yourself feel good. And uh, what is more useful is to sit down, uh, really listen to the people that you are trying to give uh, privacy and security advice to, figure out what it is that they need and uh, what tools they're actually willing to use and that work inside of the you know, workflows that they already have. Uh, for example, it is extremely common still in information security to advise uh, journalists and activists, just don't use Facebook. Don't use Facebook. Facebook tracks you. Facebook is, is invasive. 
Uh, Facebook does all kinds of terrible things. Why would you use Facebook? If you use Facebook, you do not deserve privacy or security. This is an extremely harmful uh, approach to helping people because it does not actually help anyone at all. Uh, if you have ever actually done uh, activism on the internet, uh, you would know that it's actually very difficult to do activism uh, without having some sort of presence on Facebook uh, in, in an effective way. There are uh, countries located all over the world where the um, where dissidents and journalists and people who are critical of their local government gather on Facebook and communicate almost entirely through Facebook. And if you decide that you are going to leave Facebook out of your activism or out of your journalism, uh, then essentially you are cutting yourself off from the work that you are there to do. Uh, and so the harm reduction approach uh, really looks at uh, not just telling people not to do things, but figuring out what you're going to do when they ignore you and they decide to do them anyway, and trying to minimize the harm that is being done uh, through uh, behavior that might compromise their privacy or security. So uh, if a journalist or activist is using Facebook and uh, they are very concerned about maintaining uh, a anonymity, uh, in the face of subpoenas or warrants that might be sent to Facebook for their identity as the administrator of a Facebook group, they might want to log in only using Tor. And that is effective advice for harm reduction. Uh, so that's what harm reduction looks like. And again, this is one of those things that happens when you think of uh, cybersecurity, not as protecting networks, but as protecting human beings. Uh, la the last thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, was uh, normally at this time I would talk about stalkerware, but I have talked about stalkerware a lot. So I'm going to talk really quickly about um, about AirTags. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Apple AirTag, um, but the Apple AirTag is a product that Apple came out with just a few months ago, uh, which is designed, uh, it is a... Um, it's about the size of an American quarter. Uh, it looks like it's made of plastic and it is designed to be attached to something that you are concerned about losing, like your keys or your wallet or maybe a bicycle. And the idea is that this, uh, this device is paired to your phone uh, and it communicates with that phone using Bluetooth. Uh, so that if you lose it, you will, uh, or when the device is out of Bluetooth range of your phone, uh, you will get a, a beep telling you that these things have been, uh, have been separated. So this is supposed to help you uh, not lose stuff. Uh, now, this is not a new idea. Uh, there's a company called Tile that has been essentially doing uh, something very similar for many years. Um, but the way that a Tile works uh, is it's about the same size. It also pairs to a phone, um, but it pairs to a phone which is running uh, the Tile app. And when the, uh, the Tile is out of Bluetooth range of, uh, of the phone to which it is paired, it will start communicating only with other phones that are running the Tile app. Uh, and this enables the, the phone to which the, uh, the tile is paired um, to get a physical location of where the tile is located. So sometimes if you're in a really crowded city, this is the sort of thing that works well because there are a lot of phones around and the chances that one of them is running the tile app and can tell you where your, uh, where your lost wallet is um, are relatively high. Uh, what Apple did that was very different was uh, instead of counting on you to install an app on your phone, they non-consensually turned every iPhone with Find My turned on uh, into a member of the network that, uh, that the AirTag talks to. So you might be able to get through a day without getting within 30 feet of a phone that has the Tile app installed on it, but good luck getting through the day without getting within uh, Bluetooth distance of a single iPhone. So this is a much more powerful network that can give you a lot more insight into where a thing is located. Uh, now, this, um, 
These things are great for keeping track of your, of your keys or your wallet, but it turns out that they're also great for stalking because it's very easy to slip one of these items into somebody's purse uh, or as, uh, as I have also seen uh, into the trunk of someone's car or underneath their license plate. Uh, and uh, and track people in that way. Uh, Apple, when they first uh, came up with this product, uh, came to me and said, no, 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 we, we have thought about stalkers. We thought about stalkers very hard. Uh, if you are out of range of your, uh, of your device, uh, af uh, after three days, the device will begin to beep. So I went ahead, I got one of these devices and I waited for the beeping noise. Three days later, I get the beeping noise. Never mind, you get three free, free days of spying. But uh, the beeping noise goes off. I put uh, the uh, air tag under a cushion. No one can hear the beeping noise anymore. Furthermore, if I was hearing impaired, I would not have been able to hear the beeping noise. The beeping noise is not a very effective countermeasure. Um, then they said, aha, this is not the only protection that we have. If you uh, have an iPhone and you are running Find My, and we see that your phone is near an AirTag that appears to be traveling with you, uh, it will warn you. It will tell you that you are being tracked. And I'm like, ah, that's great. Now we're getting somewhere. Uh, except what happens if you don't own an iPhone? Is there some sort of app for people with Androids? And they said, no, no. They simply could not imagine a world in which not everybody had uh, an, an Apple device. This was their weird blind spot. And again, this is because they were focused on protecting networks and they sort of started to think about protecting people, but they didn't quite get all the way there because they couldn't think of people with Android devices as people. Um, since then, uh, I have written a, a very angry uh, op-ed uh, in uh, in Wired about the ways in which uh, the AirTag can be used for stalking, and Apple has announced that they will be putting out an Android app in December. So I'm patiently awaiting because I am going to hold them to it. So as you may see, uh, some of this uh, act of, uh, of you know doing research and then holding companies accountable is sometimes done by public figures. And uh, Bruce Schneier, who is on the board of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, it calls these people public interest technologists. Uh, this work includes the, the work of uh, John Scott Railton and uh, Bill Bartzak at Citizen Lab, uh, Matt Mitchell, uh, who was most recently, I think, working for the Ford Foundation. It includes congressional tech fellows in the United States and uh, researchers at uh, Consumer Reports. So there are all kinds of uh, public figures that do this work of holding people accountable. Um, but I'm going to argue that it's not enough to work in the public interest. We need to center the needs and experiences of populations whose needs have traditionally been pushed to the periphery of cybersecurity. And that includes women, LGBTQ populations, uh, black and indigenous people of color, people in authoritarian countries, activists, journalists, uh, the homeless, people with disabilities, including visual and hearing disabilities, survivors of intimate partner abuse, uh, and the reason for this is because if you center the needs of people who are normally pushed to the periphery of the discussion in cybersecurity, who are normally thought of as edge cases, and you make them the center of your work, you will automatically address the needs of comfortable 20-something middle-class white men living in Santa Clara. But if you build a tool that is uh, meant to be used mostly by comfortable middle class white men living in Santa Clara, you will never get around to addressing the needs of people in marginalized communities. So uh, where, where are we on this? Uh, we're making some progress. Uh, for example, the White House executive order in March of this year established a gender policy council to investigate the ways in which women journalists are disproportionately targeted and silenced by online harassment. And I think that's very important research and activism. Um, but it does not end at, uh, at the White House or indeed with public interest technologists. Uh, this work uh, has to be done by people like you. As cybersecurity professionals, you are powerful. You are influential. 
the decisions that you make in your work, what you build, how you build it, how it's locked down, what who is important to protect, what is important to protect, what protection even looks like, all of these decisions matter. And together, we can build a cybersecurity practice that focuses on the needs of people, because that is the only way we are ever going to move beyond perpetuating existing inequalities. Thank you very much.